Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brains and Bronx Company, how leading organizations blend the best of physical and digital with Rob Siegel. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. As you may have just seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Center, along with our partner Mentor Cloud, launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. You can create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in the moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So find or become a mentor today by using the link in the, ch the, link in the chat. Mentorship matters to all entrepreneurs. Their success is dependent on it. Quick housekeeping item before we get started. We're gonna open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. Now, none of what we do here at the center could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sanzini, Woodrow Sawyer, BPM, and NZTE. We are humbled by their contributions. During these still pretty unique times, we're curious on how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs we work with. So we're gonna start by taking a quick poll to let us know how you're doing. The first question, how are you feeling? We've been measuring this since the beginning of 2020. So hopefully those of you out there are feeling a little bit more optimistic, but still understand that there are a little bit of survival mode, anxiousness and fear out there. So let us know how you're doing. The second question, what's keeping you up at night? That one helps inform us on what responsive programming you, the entrepreneurs we serve, want. So if you give us some of those responses, we will get started in a moment. Really appreciate you guys giving us some of your input. Um, I don't wanna waste too much time on this one because I wanna jump into our discussion today, but thank you for your responses. I'm gonna share these results really quick. Optimism's on the rise, but totally understand some of you are feeling a little anxiety and just survival mode out there. And a good mix of finance, sales, marketing, pivoting, and just surviving out there. So I'm gonna stop sharing these and we're gonna jump right in. So without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome in the chat to our special guest, Rob Siegel. He's a VC and many time entrepreneur, and he's also a lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Rob, welcome. Thank you so much, Colin. It's great to be here. So happy to have you for this discussion on your new book. Um, so I'm going to jump right into some, some questions. Your journey is truly unique. And can you talk a little bit about the path that led you to where you are today? And more importantly, what drew you to entrepreneurship? Well, I actually started working for an entrepreneurial company when I did my undergraduate work at the University of California, Berkeley. I went to work for a software company and I didn't intend that to be my career. It just kind of happened. And so I worked for the software company that ultimately we took public in the mid 90s, went to Stanford to do my graduate work and then bounced around between various large companies and smaller companies. I worked for Intel. Uh, I ran a division of GE, but I also started a company that made the world's first digital picture frame and that company got bought by uh, Kodak and worked for a semiconductor company that ultimately got bought by Sony. And so eventually, as I made my way into venture capital, spent a bunch of my time, uh, you know, funding startups, you know, hundreds of them that I've seen over the years. Uh, and then inside of the Stanford, you know, which is kind of the epicenter of Silicon Valley, a lot of the startup activity have been very involved in the curriculum around what we teach around venture financing and entrepreneurship as well. So you have a little bit of exposure to entrepreneurship, to say the least. Just a little. I, yeah, I'm bald and gray for a reason. I love that. Well, we're here to talk about your new book. What was the aha moment that drew you to write The Brains and Brawn Company? So I had been teaching five different courses uh, at Stanford, and two of them, The Industrialist Dilemma and Systems Leadership, look at how what happens when every product that we build and sell is connected. How do you think about you know, developing products, organizing your company, and thinking about, you know, new types of markets that will be enabled when you have a world where everything's connected. And when the pandemic hit, you know, we got a, uh, an email message to everybody at Stanford that said, hi, we're all going to be on Zoom starting next week, get at it. 
And it was the end of the winter quarter. Uh, and so I spent a week kind of basically kind of faking my way through it. And then we had two weeks where we fundamentally had to kind of reconstruct how we were going to teach everything that we do in the classroom, you know, the, the Socratic method that we use for, for teaching a lot of our things. All of that kind of goes away because you can't read people anymore. You can't read body language anymore. And so you have to figure out how to teach in this medium. And so we had to fundamentally reconstruct all of the ways that we teach and figure out how to you know, keep the students engaged, try to be entertaining and also be educational. And about two weeks in, it kind of hit me that as a, an instructor, I was living much of what I was teaching of a world that you know, combines digital and physical. And as soon as I was realizing that I was teaching students all over the world uh, in various time zones, it kind of hit me that the, the kind of this notion of digital plus physical was something that I was living much in the same way that all the guests you know, who come to my, you know, courses, you know, what they've been going through. And so that was kind of my aha. And that's what led to the writing of the book. That's awesome. We all lived that transformation, my <laughs> friend. So um, looks like uh, we're getting through it. Um, so we're constantly told that digital transformation, um, especially last year, is the most important issue facing companies today. You're a Silicon Valley veteran who's tired of hearing that. Why? <laughs> because it's almost become trite. And just kind of something that people say, and it's, it's, by the way, it's very important, right? How we use digitization to improve systems and processes, you know, it matters, but the problem is it's kind of necessary, but not sufficient. And we are still physical creatures in a physical world. And if you look at companies that have really kind of understood this, let's look at Amazon. We do a lot of shopping online, but what they are also really good at are things like logistics, supply chain, et cetera. And so we're seeing companies that understand digital and physical. Uber is a company that does digital plus physical. But by the same token, even companies like Airbus, right? When you get on an airplane, and I don't know if you've been on an airplane recently, but do you remember when we used to fly on airplanes, right? That flight, wherever you were going, generates a terabyte of data. So, you know, all the world, you know, as every product is connected, blends digital and physical and business leaders need to understand whether they are entrepreneurs and startups or whether they're inside of an existing organization trying to develop new products, how you think about blending these two things together. That's amazing, Rob. And so you developed a framework uh, for the brains of bronze. Um, was there a specific moment that led you to realize that the best companies are blending both digital and physical? Well, we've been really lucky. You know, the, the great thing about teaching at a place like Stanford is, is the leaders, the men and women from all over the world will come and they let us study their companies and they'll share their learnings. And so, you know, we saw that the, when we started teaching some of the classes, we kind of assumed the old incumbents would, you know, they would die like dinosaurs and the disruptors would come in and change them. And we kind of, as we saw over multiple years, that actually wasn't what was happening. We saw certain incumbents that were doing a great job and certain incumbents that were struggling, but we also saw some disruptors that really kind of got it. And that led to this notion of brains and brawn because we realized that what the real winning companies were doing was they would take advantage of all the things that a digital platform can bring, scale of data, ongoing communication and connectivity for customers. But they also understood things like supply chain, manufacturing, shaping and driving your ecosystems were just as important for business success. And so it was kind of over a period of time that the pattern that we saw was that companies were really, the, the real winning companies were good at both. Yeah, and um, as mentioned, we talked a little bit about your background as a VC, a many time entrepreneur, um, and also holding positions, at, an executive position at GE. And you teach at Stanford, so you get exposure to a bunch of great young budding entrepreneurs. Um, so how does this background, uh, I guess, inform the way that you view the physical and digital divide? Yeah, I guess I'm kind of living proof that sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, and in my situation, I was able to, you know, take not only what I get to study and learn at Stanford, we get access to, to, you know, amazing people who will talk to us because, you know, we're an academic research institution, we're not the press. As a venture capitalist, I'll see hundreds of companies a year, but also as an operator, somebody who actually, you know, had a foot, you know, running companies that are both large and small. And there's an empathy that you really start to understand what people are going through, whether they're in a large organization like Michelin or Target or Majid Al-Futam in the Middle East or whether it's a startup company and one that's growing and scaling, which we've seen like some of the examples we cite in the book, like Instacart and Desktop Metal. And so my, you know, I think the, the thing that I've been able to get from my experience is to understand, you know, what the men and women who are running these companies or even are just middle level leaders inside of these companies, what they're going through is they're trying to figure out how to kind of operate successfully and help the organization achieve their goals. You still have to execute at the end of the day. 
Absolutely. If you don't execute, it doesn't matter. Um, so diving into a little bit on your VC background, uh, you frequently work with tech startups. Um, what are some of the traditional competencies that startups typically overlook and underappreciate? You know, if you think here in Silicon Valley, right, when you know, I look at my students, you know, very rarely do they want to go to work for Caterpillar or John Deere or, you know, companies that we think kind of industrial organizations, right? They're still drawn to the Twitters, the Facebooks, the Googles at all, whoever's hot, Snowflake, you know, choose your favorite, you know, Zoom, choose your favorite tech company. And we'll see this notion of, you know, people behind desks back when we were before the pandemic, you know, on screens, et cetera. And, and what'll say, go through their heads is, oh, you know, manufacturing, I'll just find a contract manufacturer and I'll do that in China or someplace else. And so what happens is in a world where digital and physical come together, you, know, you realize that things need to be highly deterministic, that you, know, you need to understand that in these early days, as new products are being developed, you think about healthcare, you think about mobility. A lot of the men and women that were graduating have never been on a factory floor. They've never seen a CNC machine. And so they don't really understand what's involved in managing a supply chain or what does it mean to get yields up in a factory plant. And, and you have to understand in a world where everything's connected that if the sales organization sells a particular product or a configuration to somebody, you have to understand how that ripples all the way through to different parts of your organization, such as manufacturing or engineering. And so what, what we are finding is that is, is in the venture community, unbelievably great engineers and business leaders who were coming out of, you know, wonderful places, but they didn't really have in-depth understanding and or experience with what's involved in making real physical products. Yeah. And it's still a process at the end of the day, whether it's selling software or moving toothbrush from A to B. Absolutely. Yes. Um, as a, as a VC, do you look at companies with brains and brawn as one of your investment theses? Absolutely. You know, so, so, in fact, if you look at things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, one of the things that we've seen in our in the funds with which I work, you know, it's the what I'll call the horizontal solutions in those areas uh, tend to be very, you know, generic. And the economic rents of the you know the better algorithms that seems to go to the infrastructure providers, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts, etc. What we've seen really interesting is when companies are applying, you know, digital and artificial. Uh, capabilities, uh, artificial intelligence to specific markets. The company we funded called Loom Lash, which is actually a computer vision and robotics uh, solution applied to eyelash extensions, right? So they were able to take technology, a combination of digital and physical and apply it to the beauty market. And the two founders, one of them came from the beauty space and one was a computer vision expert out of UC Berkeley. So, you know, those are where we're finding some really interesting opportunities and the ability to, you know, find great companies to fund. That's great. And I'm sure many of the entrepreneurs in our audience are interested on some of your tips of fundraising in the early days. So do you have any advice on that? Uh, yes. So I would say, number one, be sure to, when you're communicating with potential investors, try to find investors where the types of returns that your company is likely to bring will meet the need of the investors. I and mean, that could be, you know, the size of the fund you're talking to, you think about the size of your business, what's it really going to be, et cetera. You know, tell the investors what your opinion of what the business is, not what you think that they want to hear. Secondly, make sure that you're very transparent in terms of where you're at in product development, where you're at in customer engagement, et cetera. Uh, third, have an opinion on how big this product in this market is through a bottoms up analysis, understanding not just, hey, there's, you know, three trillion dollars that are spent, you know, on legal software, you know, kind of narrow it down and try to think about exactly how much you're really going after and understand what the sizes of your business. That's, by the way, a good discipline for you as an entrepreneur, but it will also help in your conversations with potential investors. Super helpful. Um, diving back into the book, traditional companies are trying to digitize to stay relevant. You mentioned caterpillars of the world. What are the key brainy competencies that they should be focusing on? Well, every company, be they incumbents or disruptors, we, know, we identified five that, that really kind of you know, resonated where we saw great companies could do these five things. The first is the left hemisphere or analytics. And it's more than just the ability to, you know, make sure that you can, you know, have data engineering and data science, but also ensuring that you know what to do with the data and how we're deciding how you're going to use the data. There's the right hemisphere, which is thinking creativity. And we introduced this notion of what we call grinding creativity, 
this idea that you know you look for not only new technologies and new creative ways to, to develop new products, but also new business models. And if you can combine new technology and new business models, that's an, uh, a great thing. Empathy is the third one, which is the amygdala, which is our ability to kind of make sure that we understand and can relate to our customers, our employees, and our key constituents. And we, in the book, we talk about Kaiser Permanente and Bernard Tyson, who was one of the greatest leaders I ever had the privilege of studying and knowing. You know, fourth, the prefrontal cortex, taking risk. Not only how does the company take risk and reward with risk, but how are individuals inside of an organization either rewarded or not for taking risks and making sure that taking risks is smart, intelligent, but a part of the culture. And that's particularly acute and, and, a, and a real challenge for larger incumbent organizations. And then finally, you know, we look at the inner ear, which is balancing what we own versus what we partner with other people. And the, the metaphor I like to use is thinking about a castle and thinking about how far out you expand your castle walls. What do you want inside your castle walls and what do you want outside? And how do you think about that in a world where everything is connected, but you're not going to be able to do everything on your own and you're going to have to think about partnering in a smart way with others. Those are key brainy attributes. Um, the, and so to stay in that side of the brain if, if for a moment, the pandemic accelerated so many companies' digital transformation efforts. So what's the key to doing it effectively if you're a large physical incumbent? And what's a, what's a company that's done it really well? So interestingly enough in the book, I juxtapose Schwab and Facebook as two companies and how they handle analytics. And what I actually like to highlight is I, I want to talk about some of the attributes of what Schwab does well. Now, Schwab is a financial services organization with about $7 trillion that have been deposited inside of the company. And so, you know, they've got some good data engineers and some good data scientists. But what I found really interesting about Schwab was how they thought about using the data, that just because they have data and they have information doesn't necessarily mean that they should use it. And a great example of this that Walt Bettinger, the CEO, shared with us is that if a customer goes on their phone or on the, you know, through a browser and goes to the Schwab website and goes to life events divorce, Schwab might know at that moment in time that there's something that's going to happen in that person's life and might even know it before the spouse does. And the question that Schwab asks when they deal with data is what would our customers want us to do with this? Right. You know, they, they talk about through clients' eyes and they make every decision through clients' eyes. And so not only do you have to be good at slinging code, but you've also got to have humans in the loop and have kind of, a, if you will, a compass or a North Star about how you're going to use data. And I juxtapose that to Facebook. And while Facebook, we've got to give them a great hat tip, right? It's a company that's worth a trillion dollars and they, you know, print money as we saw this week in, in their numbers. But the flip side of it is I don't think anybody believes that Facebook uses our data for what we want, there's kind of a conventional wisdom that Facebook will use the data for what Facebook wants. And one of the things that we found was that great companies not only had to develop the digital competencies and bring it in house, they couldn't outsource it, but they had to have kind of that compass all, you know, about what's the right way to be using the data and what would be ways of using the data that customers would want. That is way too true. And in the book, you also, shared two attempts during the pandemic of radical transformations. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about um, some of the lessons learned through that? So in the book, we compared uh, 23andMe, you know, the, the Silicon Valley based company to Daimler. And so with 23andMe and Wojcicki and the team, you know, they, they've got all of this information on us genetically. We spit into the tubes and we send it off to 23andMe and they sequence the, the information and they, they tell us about our health and our proclivity to certain diseases, where we came from, our ancestry. Uh, but they used, they realized they could use the information for actually, uh, you know, how to develop drugs and maybe develop drugs more cost effectively than traditional pharmaceutical companies do. And so Anne and the team, you know, studied and said, okay, what are the things that we're good at and where do we need to partner? And, you know, a couple of years ago, they partnered very, you know, closely with GSK, the large British pharmaceuticals company run by Emma Walmsley. And so, you know, Emma and the team made an investment of about $350 million into 23andMe. And the two are, companies are collaborating on drug development and trying to take the best of both teams to combine together to, to you know, get these drugs out to market, including using GSK's Salesforce and manufacturing competencies. And so when I did the analysis on 23andMe on the 10 attributes, the five brain and the five brawn, which you know, I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment, 23andMe scored pretty high because they actually were really, really good in understanding what needed to be done in certain areas. And even on something like manufacturing where their score wasn't that high, they had been able to partner quite well with um, 
uh, you know, 20, to, uh, GSK to actually, you know, w- when the drugs get approved to get it to market. And I juxtapose that to Daimler and how Daimler, you know, with Mercedes was trying to deal with all the transformations that are going on in the mobility industry. And when I studied Mercedes, one of the things that I found is like manufacturing design of cars, like best in the world, like those cars are beautiful, but they had really done a very poor job in figuring out things like how to handle data and, and how to partner. You know, they made decisions that were really about what Mercedes wanted and were not about what the customers wanted. You know, for a, a great example of that is they didn't make it easy for people to use, you know, whether car, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you know, for the user experience. They could have easily done things that allowed us to use Spotify, that allowed us to use Waze and Google Maps or, or Apple Maps, whatever you want to use. They kind of wanted to hold on to that customer experience. And by the way, they weren't as good as a lot of other providers. And so Daimler, when it went through it, had a much lower score than 23andMe. Now, the aha in this is that Daimler should be able to look at this and say, oh, okay, these are areas we need to work and improve upon. And similarly, right, that's exactly what we saw, you know, with, with the idea is that anybody can take these 10 variables of brains and brawn and apply it to their own company and say, okay, realistically, how are we doing today? And where are the areas where we need to improve? I love that. And Rob, we talked about the five brainy competencies, but what are the five brawn? Okay, the five brawny competencies. These are the unsexy things that are absolutely necessary to make life work. The first one is our spine, which is logistics. You know, how well can you get products and services to customers? And we looked at companies like Best Buy and Target and Home Depot, all of whom just killed it during the pandemic. But they had already set up a great digital and physical uh, combination that their logistics are world class. We looked at hands, the craft of making things, manufacturing. And one of the things we looked at, it was a new company, Desktop Metal, using additive and 3D manufacturing and how that's changing not only how things are made, but where things are made. Third, we looked at muscles operating at scale. When everything's connected, right, you can be operating on a global basis, but you also need to be able to customize for local markets. And in that, we looked at Michelin, the large French tire company, to figure out how they're operating globally. Fourth, we looked at hand-eye coordination. And for that, we studied Google Android, really trying to understand how Google has had to shape the ecosystem. You know, Android has 85% market segment share on a global basis, and yet they don't even really own the software, right? It's open source. And how have they shaped the ecosystem to kind of get things that they want? And then finally, stamina. How do you survive over time? And the company we studied in depth there was Johnson & Johnson, you know, a company that's been around for a long, long time and has been able to kind of, you know, go through the ups and downs and and some challenging uh, situations, some of which they find themselves in now. I love that. And um, pairing both of them, what's what are the pandemic's impact on all 10 of these competencies? I think the pandemic accelerated things. You know, we saw it in some of the numbers of, you know, there's the, the line that you know, the pandemic made, you know, uh, three years of expected e-commerce uptake happen, you know, in three months versus three years. Uh, and, and we saw that with some of the companies, you know, the, the ones that many of them that we studied really, you know, were able to kind of pull away from their competitors. If I go back to the retail side, you know, Best Buy, what they really transformed themselves, you know, not just selling electronics equipment, but really being the service provider to the people who come in and buy the products to make sure that when everything's connected, when you try to connect it in your home, that's really Really hard. They had an unbelievably good business in time during the pandemic. Similarly, Target was able to accelerate its online order shopping, you know, and then you could drive to the store and get delivery at a time when getting groceries was hard and the like. Target really kind of had all the foundation there to throw gasoline on the fire and really do a great job to serve customers. And then, you know, the last one I'll talk about is Home Depot. Since we were all at home, everybody was improving their house. And one of the things Home Depot had done, Craig Miniar, the CEO, talks about don't fight the inevitable. He was our customers, they actually want to shop digitally. So they made it easier to shop digitally. And they had these big regional distribution centers. They put by all the stores, you know, throughout the United States. And and they are able to deliver products. You order something, they can get it to a local store in three hours. So you saw companies that during the pandemic were really able to do so much better just, you know, by because they had that combination of digital plus physical. I love that. And also, I mean, through your, you've done tons of research. um, And so which company would you say it did it the best during our last 18 months? Oh, that's hard. I I think it's hard to, you know, probably argue that Amazon, I'd say Amazon, you know, just because like, you know, we've all become dependent upon them. um, And, 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 and they've really, you know, uh, we, you look at how there was a joke, a great tweet I saw that the person was saying, he, 
He spends half of his day breaking down Amazon boxes that get delivered to the house. And we become kind of, you know, those patterns of behaviors become ingrained, you know, and, you know, they're going to face some challenges going forward, obviously. But if you look at the numbers they reported this week, the, the company's done real well. Um, I, I think right now that's the one we're having to look at. That, that That's kind of just a fiercely uh, successful company. Apple, obviously, you know, has done really well during the pandemic. Obviously, both those companies uh, being very, very highly regarded in Apple dealing with a supply chain you know, it challenges, you know, bringing stuff in from China, they really kind of didn't miss a beat. And, and that's pretty incredible. Awesome. And so based on your research and insights that you've done with these larger organizations, what are some of the takeaways for our early stage entrepreneurs who may be a girl, a guy, a dog in a garage? You know, you know I think that it's developing that mindset of understanding blending digital and physical. And towards the end of the book, one of the things we talk about is this notion of what I call systems leadership. And systems leadership is this idea that leaders, as, as everything's connected, really kind of have to see the system. They have to understand the interactions you know, of, of what happens and the functions inside of their organizations, as well as you know, how your company interacts with the broader ecosystem and the companies in your ecosystem. You have to know how to manage and operate at scale, but you also have to know how to innovate with small teams. You have to be able to blend IQ and EQ. And so I think this duality of the systems leader, you know, somebody who is an entrepreneur needs to even if you're a digital startup, you need to be making sure that you're building the DNA into your organization and understand where are you touching the physical world and what's happening both to yourself and your customers and the supply chain and everything along the way. And I think it's kind of that mindset and that ability to really you know, see the system, see the flow and where you fit in. That's, I think, one of the key things that will separate great entrepreneurs from those entrepreneurs that will struggle going forward. I love that. And um, you also teach a class, an entire class at Stanford um, called Systems Leadership. And so what, what are some of the insights from that course that you uh, would like to share beyond what you just shared uh, for our, our attendees today? Well, I think great systems leaders do a couple of things. The first is they're able to see intersections that are not obvious. Uh, an example of that is you look at Align Technology who makes you know, the clear plastic aligners that straighten teeth. They were able to figure out that not only could the technology uh, you know, do a better job than brackets and wires for straightening our teeth, but also they could actually then work with a different channel, you know, uh, dentists to actually sell these products. And I think great leaders kind of need to understand how you combine like great business model innovation with great technological innovation. They have the ability to see connections between things that aren't obvious. You know, it's a little known fact that Samsung, when we think of Samsung, we think semiconductors, you know, we think smartphones. They're actually the world's largest manufacturer of generic biologic drugs because they realized that the manufacturing process for semiconductors is actually quite similar to the manufacturing process for uh, making uh, pharmaceuticals. And so they've actually built a, you know, 10 to $15 billion a year business based upon those manufacturing things. I think other things systems leaders to do is they have like a product manager's mindset. They understand well the customers, they understand the inside of the business. They know how to influence and shape the organization even if they don't you know, directly control resources and they're great storytellers, right? It's very important for entrepreneurs to be great storytellers, to be able to tell the narrative and to get people excited about what you're doing. And then finally, I think great leaders, you know, they know their own strengths and their own development needs. They understand, you know, what are the things that they're good at? What are the things that they're not good at? And they have the ability to accurately look back on their past successes and say, when was I lucky? And when was I the right person for the right job? And what's the difference? And so I think that there's a kind of this notion that systems leaders really need to understand, again, the flow of how everything interacts, the ability to kind of control a narrative, the ability to see connections, you know, that product manager's mindset, and then also the ability to lead people. That's great. And Rob, a lot of this, which I love about the book, is talking about the foundations, right? Setting up the right systems and processes in place to inform, let's say you got to order for a thousand pieces of software, a thousand units. Of, um, of an actual physical product. Um, you know, I think a lot of founders in the early days think about the external stuff before the internal stuff. So I love this. Um, talking about a little bit of the external stuff, you did mention a little bit about this, but it's about like how important is it to using your pitch to new employees, to potential prospects, uh, to investors even, how important is it to include this type of language when uh, going out into the world? 
I think if you can express to others that you understand where you fit into the big picture, the, the part of the sandbox that you're going to try to take, but what the whole sandbox looks like, that allows people to understand truth. So one of the things we talk about in the book is that truth equals facts plus context. All right. And so that, you know, I talked about great storytellers. Brian Cornell, the CEO of Target, is one of the best storytellers that I've ever heard. You know, he really seeks to understand and listen. Like when he interacts with students, he'll ask them questions, trying to pull in information and to try to understand like their perspective and point of view. But he's got his narrative. He controls his narrative of, you know, who Target is and why. And we saw that like in 2017 when they were investing heavily in, in, uh, you know, redoing their stores and investing in their stores, Wall Street punished Target uh, because Wall Street didn't want them to invest the money making the stores better. They wanted them to, you know, you know, keep costs down. And Brian said, we have to do this and have to invest. And he stayed on message. Similarly, when Apoorva Mehta, you know, the, he's the chairman of Instacart, you know, he was the CEO of the time. When he came in, he talked about really understanding the four key constituencies that he needed to manage. And so that ability to kind of tell that story and shape for people the context how everything fits together, that allows you know, great leaders to be able to communicate with different or, you know, parts of people that they may need to deal with, be they you know, slimy, scum-sucking venture capitalists like me, be they employees that you're trying to recruit, or even customers who you're trying to you know, sell the product to, right? Because you know, great leaders, you're always, you're always selling to try to make sure that your customers are happy and they understand the value that you're bringing when they buy your product or service. Yeah, that's, that's amazing advice. And one thing that I think a lot of early stage companies deal with is struggling with getting top talent, right? And so how, how do you, what's your advice around um, attracting the right people with the right brains or the people with the brawn to come under the organization to help it scale? You're going to attract different type of people at different phases in their career because they're going to be motivated by different things. So, you know, I think one of the things we talk about in the book is empathy, right? We, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, trying to understand where somebody else is coming from. And empathy maybe is an overword, overused word in society today. But, you know, if you're hiring, you know, people who are closer to the beginning of their careers, you know, they're looking for growth. They're looking for opportunities to be thinking about, you know, how will they be able to, you know, have the trajectory that they want to achieve. But by the same token, if you look at the younger generation versus, say, my generation, you know, people have a different attitude towards work and towards companies. And so can you give them the flexibility they need? If they're, you've got to assume they're going to have a side hustle, right? So that's one of those things, you, you know, hopefully you can make that side hustle be a part of something maybe they're doing inside of the organization. And I think really trying to understand what are the motivations of people at a moment in time. For me, at this phase in my life, when I'm working, I just want to be doing something that I find rewarding. And, you know, like I might, you know, I'm, as I get to, you know, the second half of my career, I'm less concerned about trying to get somewhere. It's kind of, I'm already where I want to be. All I want to be doing is trying to make sure I'm working with people I like, that I'm learning new things. And so anybody I engage with, if they were trying to understand what motivates me, that's what they should be thinking about. And so I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, I think great systems leaders and especially entrepreneurs going forward have to think about the future of work. Now, future of work is often talked to, to mean a lot of different things. And the pandemic brought out this notion of, you know, remote work and hybrid work. I think we need to be thinking about, you know, globalization 1.0. Globalization 1.0 was basically labor arbitrage, right? You know, you put low cost manufacturing in one location, you put uh, low cost engineering in, in Eastern Europe, you might put low cost customer service in India. And we should have anticipated the displacement of labor and capital. Like we all should have known this. We all, the good news is we all got cheap TVs. The bad news is we got rising populism. I would argue if you're an entrepreneur or even a leader of any level in an organization, you've got to be thinking about how are the next set of technologies between artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, et cetera. How's that going to displace the next set of jobs? Because we know it's going to happen. And leaders need to be thinking about, okay, how do I retrain my labor force now so that when these changes come in, you know, I will have the ability to keep these, you know, employees inside of the organization and they can continue to be productive, right? And this is stuff like, we know this, like we know this is coming. I would argue that's one of the things about, you know, if you can tell a story to, to people that you're recruiting and that you're hiring, not only are you going to be able to do this job, but I'm hopeful you're going to be able to do the next two jobs and I'm going to help you get there. Like that's a very powerful message that you can tell when you're recruiting. Super helpful advice. And I mean, you were talking about robotics and AI, um, you know, potentially taking some jobs off, but creating others, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's this company in San Francisco that has robots that make lattes. Um, 
So yeah, that's gonna that's just gonna be an interesting greenfield opportunity for more companies to develop different roles and different and uh, throughout the organization. Um, Rob, to shift gears a little bit, mentorship is a core of our, one of the core tenets of the mission of the center. How has mentorship impacted you throughout your journey? And uh, what's some of your advice around the, you know, getting mentors to support early stage entrepreneurs? If I think back on my career, there are a few mentors that I've had that had disproportionate impact on me and on my life. Um, you know, people like Andy Grove and Avram Miller and Les Fidesz from Intel, Brian Doherty from GeoWorks, uh, Robert Bergelman from Stanford, Julie Wainwright, who's the CEO of The Real Real. And, and, and I think in all of those situations, I had mentors who their, you know, the way that we worked together was they were trying to grow me and they always challenged me, right? They were always raising the bar on me uh, and pushing me to be better, but also kind of modeling in their behavior, you know, what's the right way to do things. It wasn't they ever expected me to be perfect, but they, you know, worked hard so that I would, you know, as, you know, live up to, you know, my potential and help me achieve my dreams. And I think that mentor mentee relationships happen naturally. You know, it's kind of, you know, does a bond develop between two people? I think oftentimes mentees don't understand that sometimes it's in their interest, you know, to, to actually make sure that they're also teaching the mentor. Right. You know, that, that a mentee will often bring a point of view and a perspective that even mentors, you know, can learn from. So the, the first thing I would say is that it's a two way street. Um, the, the other thing I'll say is, you know, mentors, sometimes they're older than you. The, the, the people I just mentioned were older than I am. Um, sometimes your mentors are your peers. You know, I've got, you know, classmates and people that I've worked with who have taught me things that have had profound life impacts on me. By the way, sometimes mentors are younger than you are. Like my students, you know, I teach 330, 340 students a year. My students are sometimes, you know, my mentors. So I think it's kind of being open to that mindset of who can teach you. Uh, it never stops. You never stop learning uh, at any point in your life and in your career. Having that growth mindset is extremely important at all stages of your uh, careers, for sure. Um, and so I want to jump into Q&A in a moment. Uh, so if anybody has any questions for Rob, please drop them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. But uh, Rob, it's been great to learn a little bit more about the Brains and Brawn Company, your brand new book. Uh, finally, before we jump into Q&A, what's next for you? <laughs> Hopefully more of the same, uh, though actually that's kind of, you know, a little misleading. So in this notion of kind of, you know, growth mindset that you mentioned, uh, I've kind of made the decision that I want to blow up all of the classes that I'm teaching at Stanford and I want to come up with five new courses, uh, you know. I'm at a phase in my life where I don't want to be teaching the same things that I'm teaching now in five or 10 years uh, and be that person is just kind of, you know, I don't want it to become a greatest hit. So I don't, I don't want to stop learning. So, you know, this upcoming year will actually be the last year I teach the industrialist dilemma, which is one of the class that was kind of the foundation for the book. Max Vessel, who I co-teach the course with, we've decided we want to learn and explore some other things. My hope is that five years from now, maybe in our next conversation, uh, you know, we'll be able to talk about five new things that I'm doing and working on. And then I'll, you know, love to keep a foot in the investing side because that keeps me close to how technological innovation is shaping the planet, is shaping, you know, society, it is shaping, you know, kind of, you know, jobs and everything else. So I want to keep doing probably this, you know, stay where I'm at, but I want to keep doing, you know, new things within there and keep learning. Um, you know, I'm not at a point where like I have my dream job, like I don't ever want to do any other jobs than the one I have now. That's amazing. Well, in five years, I'll, we'll do a check-in and see what you're working on and we'll host you for another event. Um, and I'll, awesome. hold you, I'll hold you to you doing new innovative stuff. Um, what do you, so we've got a question that came in. What do you think are the best things for early stage founders uh, to spend time on? You know, first and foremost, solving, you know, a, a true pain point. Of, of what a customer has. You know, we'll often talk about the difference between a painkiller and a vitamin, right? You know, a painkiller is one that like, no matter like when, when you need a, an aspirin because you've got a headache, you'll spend money on it. But vitamin C, eh, you know, if you're feeling good about trying to be healthy, you'll take it. But if you miss a few days, no one cares. So the first thing I think for an entrepreneur is making sure that, that you're solving a real pain point for a customer. I often say that, that, that CEOs have three tasks. Number one, you've got to set kind of, you know, a vision for the company. Number two, don't run out of cash. And number three, build a great team. 
Like those are the three, I think, responsibilities of a CEO. And, you know, if you're going to be able to kind of solve a real problem, if you, if you think customer first, that'll be a great way for you to be spending time, time on things. Um, you know, a lot of times if somebody's got a, a, an innovation, a technical innovation, you know, you have this notion of technology push versus needs pull. And I think in a world where, uh, you know, it's very easy for us to, you know, bring solutions to market quickly, you know, making sure that you're solving a real pain point that customers are, will actually spend money on. That's kind of a key thing. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, revenue keeps the lights on. Exactly. And, and that's kind of a dirty word, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't have to be whether you're a nonprofit or a, uh, you know, high tech startup, you still need cash to keep paying your employees and keeping the lights and everything rolling. Um, speaking of, you spoke a little bit about uh, retaining employees as one of the, uh, is building the team is one of the key attributes of a successful CEO. So uh, we got a question here. What do you think are the best ways to develop leadership skills if you don't have them yet? You know, leadership, you know, I was talking to one of my colleagues on the faculty at Stanford this week, and she used the, shared with me the expression that leadership is not a noun, it's a verb. Right, you know, it's the process of leading your team, and so how do we do that? I think we kind of do it in every big and every little thing that we do. You know, you, you, if you you become a as you get more senior in your organizations, your employees are watching what you do. They watch you, for better or for worse, right? Because they're trying to figure out what does the boss think is important. And so as you think about you know kind of leadership, there, there's that notion of trying to understand like where do you spend your time? How do you carry yourself? And then you might say, well, Rob, that sounds entirely superficial. Well, okay kind of get over it. Everyone's watching you as you, you know, as, as you lead, um, you know, there, everyone's going to also have their own different leadership styles. You know, people will talk about the brash, bold entrepreneur. Some people will talk about the vulnerable entrepreneur who shows vulnerability. I don't think that there's a kind of a single class and way to do things. I think it's important that every leader develops her or his own style and understands really, you know, what is it that, that works for them? Uh, you know, there are things that you don't want to do. Uh, you know, you, you should basically, you know, Bob Sutton, you know, don't be a, you know, a, a dot, 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 you know, you, you don't want to do that. And then you hear the stories about how Steve Jobs was like that. Yeah, but Steve Jobs was 18 Sigma to the right of the mean. He doesn't count, right? So, so it's, our job is not to be Steve Jobs. Our job is to be ourselves. And so try to understand like what's effective. In fact, there will be times that you will notice that you might be, have been effective leading. And then you would try to take note of, well, what was it? Why was it in that situation you were effective? And why was it in the situation that you weren't effective? And, you know, I talked about leader, know thyself. You know, for me, one of the things is my, my, my greatest strength is also my greatest development need, which is my passion, right? You know, you put me in front of a classroom and I'm going to run up and down the aisles and I'm going to be having a ton of fun and waving my hands around and telling jokes, you know, and then you know, then I've got the challenge of like, sometimes like I, my passion can get me in trouble. Like when I was younger, like I would send the most amazing flame emails you could possibly imagine. Like I would get an email that would just infuriate me. Right. And I'd hit reply all right. And I would send a comment back that was cutting and it was scathing and it was sarcastic and it was accurate and it was always ineffective always. Yeah. And, and so I've had to learn to kind of control, you know, that, and by the way, I'm still not perfect, right? I still make mistakes sometimes. Um, and so I think, you know, people knowing about like, what are the times when like you're strong and what are the times when you're, you're not strong. I mean, the last thing I'll say on this, there was a great expression that I learned when I was at GE, which is that leadership is the ability to constrain a response to a given stimulus. You know, leadership is the ability not to take the bait. And, and I, I always, that always really stuck with me. And so, you know, that, you know, I think these are some of the best practices, but don't look to everybody else for leading, you know, look to kind of what works for you. And by the way, if you see somebody doing something you like, try it. And if it works for you, you know, keep it. And if it doesn't work for you, try something else. I love that advice. Know yourself and be yourself. <laughs> um, we've got a question here. Do you, can you reference some web developing firms that embody the brains and bronze theory? Well, I don't know specifically about web development firms, but if I think about 
what I'll like call digital companies, I guess. Yeah, well, I, if, I, if I talk about digital DNA companies, you know, companies that started digitally first, let me give one what I'll call as a non traditional example. I would argue Tesla is a digital first company that actually understands manufacturing. And by the way, they still don't have the quality of other people, but look at what they've done, what they've accomplished. You know, everything about how they designed that car was the software was the interface, not the other way around. And, and that allowed them to have ongoing communication with the customer. So that's one example, I would say, of, of a digital first company. Um, Instacart was a digital first company, right? You know, they started with how do I order from the phone and have that great experience? And then making everything happen behind that work. That's a great example of, of a digital first company. Um, you, you know, I think we can, you know, I wouldn't say that Apple was digital first. They kind of started as a blend. If you go back to the history as a computer company where they did hardware and software, but you'll notice with Apple, they did both at the same time. And if we go way back when, you know, IBM basically cobbled together the PC, you know, they got the, the, the microprocessor from Intel and they got the operating system from Windows, you know, and Lotus 123 was the first application that went on it. You know, it was Apple that kind of brought the whole thing together, which has served Apple well through, you know, computing platform transitions. And so, you know, those are three that I think come to mind um, uh, that started with digital first. And then I think that, while the jury is out on 23andMe, you know, we're going to see if they're going to be successful in getting these drugs to market. I think it's got the potential of being really, really interesting. Um, and, and we'll see how that plays out over time. We definitely will. Um, we've got a question on um, AI and how you feel about the global competition. Um, at, as a small startup with minimum capital, how do you think that they can com compete from here? You know, it's a great question. So let's break this into a couple of parts. I would say if your startup is, is, you know, artificial intelligence is a key part of what you're doing, I would focus on a vertical solution as opposed to a horizontal solution, like solve a specific customer need with the AI and focus in on that. Now, how does it play out globally? I, we've got this, you know, the, if you will, this ongoing technology conflict between the United States and China, which will continue to be a huge problem. It's going to be a huge problem for, um, you know, leaders, business leaders all over the world. In fact, in the fall, I'm teaching a new course called Business Government, you know, Business and Government, Power and Engagement in the 21st Century. And I argue that if the 20th century was about, the 20th century conflict was about political ideology, fascism versus Western democracy, communism versus Western democracy, the 21st century is a, about conflict on economic ideology. And business leaders are gonna have to deal with that, you know, figure out how to navigate through this. And on the one hand, you know, look at what happened to Didi this week, you know, and, and, and what, what happened with the Chinese government is they cracked down on their local tech sector, right? And so, you know, on the one hand, you sit there and say, well, are we gonna see a decoupling of the two largest economies, which sounds, you know, some people just don't believe that's gonna happen. On the other hand, if these things continue to happen, you as business leaders are gonna to need to have a strategy for it. You know, Jeff Immelt, my co-teacher from Systems Leadership, says you can't ignore the world's second largest economy in China. He just doesn't believe that's going to be possible. So you're going to need a strategy in a world where communication and collaboration tools become increasingly important. I mean, look at this, you know, you know what we're doing today. You know, this is my home office. I mean, my jail. I mean, my Stanford teaching studio. I mean, my home office. Like, it didn't have Stanford stuff, you know, behind me on the walls before. You used to have pictures of my grandparents and my kids. Right. And so, you know, and by the way, I'm teaching people all over the world in this setup, right? Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, in Sao Paulo, in Stuttgart, in Chicago, in Jakarta, right? And so this, by the way, is not going away. So you, as a, a small entrepreneurial company, have to be thinking about how are you not going to get caught in that tech stack, right? And so how are you going to make sure that you don't get caught in that conflict? But how are you going to serve customers well, where you've got these kind of opposing forces, of you know the geopolitical conflict and yet increasing capabilities because of communication and collaboration tools. I love that, and I'm sure we have multiple time zones on this call too. Um, so we'll find out later. Unless you want to let us know where you're at, if you're in a, if you're outside of the Bay Area or the U.S., uh, let us know because welcome. Um, let's see. Oh, I love. We had this question come in, and I love it. Um, so brand equity and networks are important moats in both the digital and physical world. Anything else that can help avert the death of a legacy company, physical dinosaur, as this person put it? You know, it's funny. Brand equity is important, but brand equity can also decay over time if you don't do a good job of serving customers better. Uh, you, know, like, you look at John Deere. 
you know, basically they make tractors fundamentally, but they also have a a layer of value added services that they're able to build on top of it, that they're able to ensure that their customers in terms of, you know, service needs, in terms of, you know, location of things, et cetera. So I think it's kind of the, you have to look at connectivity as a way to constantly be introducing new capabilities and, and, and new opportunities for your customer base. Uh, and I think that's where if you change that mindset of it's not like, hi, I sold you something and then you're going to pay me for service, but it's much more of how can I continue to improve your product? How can I continue to make it better? It will increase the complexity of your business yeah, and your CFO won't like it because, you know, he or she is going to be managing and taking in so many more different revenue streams and you might have a lot more SKUs. But the flip side of it is it allows you to engender customer loyalty over time. Right, because as long as you can keep reinventing your product and keep having that communication with your customer, I think that's a big difference uh, and things that, that really any company can do. Uh, and there's no reason why large incumbents can't do that. Yeah, I mean, many of the companies that you've talked about today have lifetime value uh, mm-hmm. where if, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't get another phone because I don't have to use any other kind of phone, right? Well, well but to ask you, you know, it's funny, you talk about lifetime value. Let me give an example of that Kaiser Permanente you know, the large healthcare provider I talked about earlier, their figure of merit that they use for the, you know, their leadership team and everybody else is they're trying to maximize, you know, the healthy life years of their, of their members. Let me say that again, their healthy life years. Kaiser figured out they make more money if they keep their members alive and healthy as long as possible. Like you think about that. That's kind of like, if you're a member, that sounds pretty awesome. Like your healthcare provider, they're not there trying to sell you more things over and over again. They're not trying to sell you drugs you don't need. They're not trying to do tests that you don't need. They want to just keep you alive and healthy as long as possible. That's how they make the most money. So, you know, you talked about LTV, increase the L, that will increase the V. I love that. I haven't heard of that, but uh, yeah, that's great. Um. So we had another question around, is it better to learn about logistics, like quality control, et cetera, or focus on the core product service um, mm-hmm. and let others handle these areas? You have to do both. That's, I think that's a false choice. You know, yeah. Yes, you've got to understand why people buy your product, but if you don't understand how you're going to get it to customers, you won't see the system. And so I would suggest that if you don't do both, you're going to have a hard time scaling as a leader on an ongoing basis where the world is increasingly connected and blends digital and physical. And so like, if you're going to have this notion of I'm going to like outsource that or just I'm going to let my colleagues deal with it. In fact, that's the whole point of systems leadership is that no longer works. You can't just say, okay, I came up through a particular domain, engineering, manufacturing, marketing, sales, whatever it is, and I'll have my teammates who will, you know, they'll do their things and we'll stay out of each other's way or maybe we'll collaborate when we have to. You actually need to understand the implication of these things between, you know, what you do in your organization and how that impacts somebody else. So, yeah, you need to know the product and, yeah, you need to know logistics. I think that's what the leaders of tomorrow will be able to do. Yeah, I think that's a big part of your of your book, Brains and Brawn, right? Um, mm-hmm. And also, just to add to the to add to what you were saying, which was, um, you know, which is great that you lose data streams if you put it in somebody else's inbox, or if somebody has a vac- goes on vacation or has a natural disaster, it's no longer in your control. So, the more control that you can have over the processes, the more data that you can consume. I think the more efficient you can be. Absolutely. Um, this one came in, um, and it's not a naive question. There's no such thing as bad questions these days, folks. Um, but what's the best way to validate an idea that re- if an idea really solves a customer problem? Well, they pay for it. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's one of those things is like, you know, if you give somebody something for free and they say yes, they say, great, you know, I, 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 you know, I now need you to pay for it. And they say, yeah, okay, we don't need it that badly. That's how you know. So, you know, one of the things that I always did when I was in startups is, you know, I would, if somebody was, if I was going to do like a proof of concept, right, you know, you're trying to get that going, I always charged for it. But what I would do is I would send them an invoice for the full amount. So let's say, for example, you, you know, you're selling something that costs $10,000. You, you know, you, you send them the invoice for $10,000. You write the 90% early access partner discount into that. So you, you discount it from 10,000 to 1,000 and you send them an invoice and it says amount due $1,000. So two things are to happen there when you do that. The first is that you establish value of your product, which is this costs $10,000, either as a one-time sale or monthly, whatever it is. The second thing is they're actually going to have to write a check to use it. And if somebody won't pay you money to use it, in particular in a B2B sense, you have no value on your product. If you're doing a B2C product, is are you know, the, a lot of the metrics we use, are they using it? How often are they using it? And what's you know, their churn rate? How often do they fall off? 
what's their engagement level over time. Those are great ways that you can you know, think about whether or not you've got you know, real value in your product. Uh, Josh Elman, who's now at Apple, you know, one of the greatest product managers in Silicon Valley, talks about how customer engagement curves, the really, the really good ones are like smiles, the way they're shaped over time. Starts high, it will drop off a little bit, but then it comes back higher because maybe there's network effects or there's other value that you're adding that brings the customers back more and more. So just try to be thinking about those kinds of things. If you know that if you, you know, get your customers to pay for it or make sure that they continue to engage with their product, that's how you know you've got something people want. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, one piece of advice that I've given to early stage entrepreneurs is uh, validating the idea with your mom and or friends is the best <laughs> move because one, they love you. And two, when you give it, when it becomes a thing, they're going to ask for it for free. So they're, yeah. they're not the right people. I find that's true with the book too. Like, you know, my family all wants free copies, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. I'll send them a free copy. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, Alrighty. So we're almost at the top of the hour and we had this last question that I was saving. So Gina, I'm still here for you. Can you summarize your framework, Rob, and maybe an abbreviated way or uh, as a quick takeaway, maybe your TikTok version of the brains and bronze? In the future, every company will combine digital and physical products and solutions. Incumbents are not doomed and disruptors are not ordained. The winners will combine the best of both of these things. The world needs a new type of leadership, systems leadership, where people understand how everything fits together and interacts with each other. These are the th key three things in the book. So concise and well said, my friend. Um, well, thank Rob, you. thank you so much. I look forward to seeing what's on the horizon for you and for so many of the entrepreneurs that joined this call, blending the best of brains and brawn. I've learned this so much and hopefully everyone else did today. So Rob, thank you so much for sharing some of your insights from your brand new book. All you guys check it out. We're going to just follow up with a link to Rob's website. So if you want to learn more and also link to buy the book. Um, so Rob, thank you again for sharing your insights from brains and brawn company today with us and me and uh, on behalf of everyone in attendance and everyone on the NASDAQ center team. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Colin. Have a great day. Awesome. Really appreciate it. For those of you still on the call, I hope you guys can join us for some upcoming webinars. Um, next Tuesday, we've got B2B Marketing and Tailoring Your Brand with Edmund Banayan. And then also on Friday, on August 19th, we've got Show Me the Money, Starting a Profited, Profitable Business with Kara Yazid. So thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you all back online soon. Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs>